Got it. Hello, hello everyone. My name is Kimry Harris and I would like to welcome you all to the street scene. As we gather, please check in on the chat by sharing your name and where you are. We are very excited to spend some time with you all today. This workshop will be recorded and posted. So if you wish to rename yourself and or have your video off, do that now. Um, if your phone is on drive mode, change that now. We have you all muted just to ensure our wonderful teachers will have no interruptions in their lessons, but also to make sure that our viewers, you all, can hear the teachers clearly as well. We also would like to invite you to hang out for questions for the, questions for the teacher after we finish at eight. Side note, this is really important guys, tune in on this one. To be able to see the instructors more clearly, make sure you're set on speaker view, which is located on the top right corner of your screen. And now that we're all gathered, again, I welcome you to street scene number four, one of six Artivism Virginia Zoom workshops. We strive to create material, skills, and agreements for the next time the environmental communities of Virginia can be together. Tonight, we are exploring the street sound, a mix of ways you can, we can make ourselves heard to protect Virginia's environment. We have three excellent teachers today. Jamison Price of Holy River, Graham Smith White of the Infinite Goodness and Technical Director for the Sunday Collective, and Joshua Vanna, Co-Director of Artivism in Virginia and Music Director of Sunsing Collective. Street Sing workshops are every other Thursday on Zoom. And the next Street Sing is called Message Out on campaign, event design, and outreach on June 11th on alternate Thursdays. Please join us, Sun Sing and Place Concerts, also at 7 p.m. and live on Artivism Virginia Facebook, Vimeo, YouTube, and our next concert is on June 4th. Now that we got all that out the way, Oh, so good to see you guys. Who's ready for the show? Give me an oh yes in the chat if you're ready for the show. I got a question for you guys to answer, if you will. Have you ever wanted to be more loud or less loud? Okay, bringing us in this evening is Joshua Vanna. He's recently located, he recently relocated to Charlottesville after being based in Shenandoah Valley for 13 years and has been plugged into the resistance to the Mountain Valley and Atlantic Coast Pipeline for four years. So give it up for Joshua Vanna, y'all. Hey all, Joshua Vanna here. Thanks for joining us. Gonna to talk to y'all a little bit about Megaphone Magic making magic happen out in the street or wherever with your megaphone. It's a wonderful tool and when used wisely, it can be one ingredient in a uh, very effective recipe for having a really cool and safe event wherever you are. Okay. So I'm gonna talk a little, bit about gear, a little bit about the environment in which we use these things. So and this one's gonna be more fun. I'm gonna finish this since I spent all this time drafting this. I'm gonna finish uh, drafting so it from here. Get our here. message across and also don't annoy and alienate each other. We've done it all so many times. So a little bit about the gear. The conventional modern electric megaphone, been around for 50, 60 years, comes in basically one shape, but many sizes, ranging from about 10 or 15 watts to 75 or 80 watts. The size of your megaphone may suit what your needs and goals are. So if you are a person who's maybe trying to spend a little less money and also is not maybe trying to get out to hundreds or thousands of people, who knows, um, maybe a smaller megaphone is right for you. If you are making a longer term investment maybe and want some of the more bells and whistles, you know, detachable microphone, siren, record function, all that jazz, then you may want a louder megaphone with more features. 
Also, today we have uh, the joy of rechargeable batteries here. Mine comes with a 5 volt battery that you can plug into the wall, as well as running on conventional D size batteries. So, this is also a budget consideration for you and maybe an effectiveness of the tool consideration. It may save you money in the long run to get something with rechargeable battery or using rechargeable C or D size batteries, depending on what your megaphone takes. We'll say that these are expensive, they're kind of a pain, they're heavy, and they're not a whole lot of fun to deal with. I just generally like to avoid them. So, however, in terms of preparedness and preparedness we all know, so essential as we go out in the street together and try to get our message heard. Uh, my charger recently uh, died and I have to get a new one. The battery's fine, but the charger is dead. So having a megaphone that then runs on batteries instead, uh, pretty convenient. So depending on what your instrument does and how it works, you just want to make sure that you're prepared with this thing, right? You want to charge your battery overnight. You want to uh, carry extra batteries with you, whether they are conventional or rechargeable. Nothing is worse than having the life sucked out of your event partway through because your important instrument of amp amplification dies. Uh, so disappointing. So, these things are mainly for outdoor use. They are really not for inside and you will alienate a bunch of people and uh, maybe cause harm, cause physical harm to someone if you're trying to use these things in a closed space. So mostly for outside, that's what you gotta remember. Um, a little bit about the mechanics of using an electric megaphone. Things we are going for. Clarity and projection, right? Clarity, folks understand what we're saying. Projection, folks, uh, more folks can understand what we're saying. Uh, and we want to avoid distortion and feedback. Those two things get in the way of folks being able to hear our message. And uh, they're also quite annoying and off-putting. Uh, they can make folks really uncomfortable and uncertain about uh, whoever's trying to get the message out. So we want to avoid those things. And how do we do that, okay? So every megaphone has a microphone. So for clarity, you don't want to get too close to this thing. If you are too close, you will cause distortion. So you maybe you want to project up in the air at a 45 degree angle to reach more folks like this. I say 45, it's <laughs> like this. But uh, up in the air and away from people's faces, right? You don't want to be putting uh, your loud, loud amplification right in someone's face. Not, not going to make you friends. Uh, but you want to stay a little bit further away from the microphone. But not too far because then it won't pick you up, right? Just like using a regular microphone with a PA system. So we can also avoid distortion by not getting too close. If you get too close, then folks won't understand you. Also, mind your volume adjustment if you have one. Uh, if your volume is all the way up, that may be causing you some feedback. And feedback is that high annoying ringing sound that none of us like. And it's going to also alienate folks as well and prevent your message from being understood. So clarity and projection, good stuff. Uh, pointing at someone's face, not so nice. And we want to avoid distortion and feedback. Other things to consider, if you have multiple folks in your group out in the street with megaphones, be sure to coordinate with them ahead of time on how you can tag team and not be uh, you know, just totally barricading folks with multiple uh, sources of amplification. And you want to, uh, you want to team up so that you can you know, not have to yell or talk the whole time. Also, if you're with other folks, the detachable microphone function that some megaphones have is really useful. You can hold this up in front of someone or have them hold it with the on off switch so that you can get your megaphone way, way up in the air like this and reach more people. So super helpful. And one last thing to keep in mind, if you are the person with this loud instrument, you uh, with great power comes great responsibility. Don't point it at someone's face. 
your goal is to not make uh, your teammates uncomfortable or strangers uncomfortable, and you don't want to hurt someone's hearing by having this too close to someone's head. So also with this loud instrument, you also have to make sure that you're listening. Don't just be that person that is shouting over everything if you are trying to work in a uh, coordinated and cooperative environment where folks have uh, shared roles in getting the message out. So some things to consider, be safe, be considerate, and uh, being mindful of your distance so that your message goes all the way out there. Folks, thanks so much for uh, tuning in for some Megaphone Magic, and I hope to see you all soon out in the street as soon as we can gather again. Okay, thanks y'all. Thank you, Josh, that was amazing. Hopefully you guys got some tips you can learn, you can use that will help you. You know, Josh really gave out some great gems. Um, next, we have Graham Smith-White, our technical director of SunSing, as I've said before, um, who also wears many, many, many different hats. Um, he's here to talk about the basics of sound reproduction and reinforcement. We will learn about how to use microphones effectively and what equipment you need for a mobile sound system. Take it away, Graham. Hey everybody, how's it doing? Graham, here to talk to you about uh, how to use microphones and PA system and all that. I've got Gabe Gavin from the SunSing Collective helping me with the camera. So I'm gonna start off by talking about microphones and how you use them and what, they're, what they do and how to connect them. So we're gonna learn a variety of terms and uh, see some equipment, what they are. So the first thing we're gonna learn is a, a type of cable that you use for microphones. It's called an XLR cable. Um, and you can see here the microphone has three pins and the cable also has three pins. Um, microphone cables are designed to be directional. And what that means is that the sound comes out of the pins and goes into the hole. Uh, so as you can see here, there's two both sides of the cable and the microphone, uh, and they go together just like that. There's a little lock on the cable, so you can pull on it and it won't come out, and you just push the button to undo the lock. Um, and then you go to your whatever you're plugging into, whether it's a mixing board or some other piece of equipment, and you would plug this end into the mixing board or the equipment. Um, there are also a couple other types of cables that you'll see um, when you're dealing with uh, musicians and maybe other people who have like a projector or some sort of media they want to play. Um, so the first is a really common one is called a quarter inch connection or an instrument cable. And it looks like this, and this is a quarter inch wide. Um, if you are trying to use something that you plug into like a headphone jack on a phone or a laptop or something, you're going to want to see this, which is called an eighth inch or a mini jack or aux cable. Um, and it's just a smaller version of that quarter inch cable or instrument cable. Um, most pieces of audio equipment don't have an input on them that will accept this. So you need some sort of adapter or converter. Here I have a cable that is on one side, the headphone mini jack, on the other side, the instrument or quarter inch cable. Um, so you use this to plug into your headphone port and then plug the other end into the sound system. Um, also, sometimes you may need to plug a microphone into a guitar amplifier or something like that if you're doing a really sort of bare bones type of scenario and you would want another type of adapter or a cable that does the, the changing. So this is that uh, holes that the sound goes into and then on the other end is the quarter inch cable so you could connect it to a guitar guitar amp or other piece of equipment that needs that. Um, so at the other end of those cables, you're usually going to find a mixing board or uh, an amplifier or something, uh, and it's going to have 
again, connections for these different types of cables on them. So if you have a microphone cable, you just plug it right in here. You can see it says mic on these connections. That lets you know that that's where a microphone goes. Um, if you had a guitar and you were trying to plug it in, you would plug it in using your guitar cable into the matching uh, jack or port. And then for PA systems can be really daunting looking. There are a lot of knobs. And if you don't know what they are, it's hard to grasp what's going on. But a, a way to really simplify it is that they're channels and they're all just copies of each other. So all of these are the same going across. Um, and they're just multiple different versions or instances of it. Uh, some of the really important parts to know about pretty much every mixing board or a uh, small sound system is uh, the, a couple parts. So one is it's called gain or is a preamp and that turns up the, the signal coming from the microphone. Uh, and they're usually red and they're almost always at the top. Uh, so each individual sound source, whether it's an instrument or a microphone would have their own uh, knob to turn to turn that up. Um, this is an equalizer and these are some sends and we're not gonna get into that, it's a little bit more advanced. Um, most PA systems will have some version of these on them. Uh, another really important thing to know about PA systems is this button here, which is the mute button. It's really important to make sure that the channel is unmuted if you want to hear what's coming from it. And then there's usually some way to determine how much of that signal goes out of the, the mixing board. Um, and it's either a fader like this that goes up and down, or sometimes it's a knob that does the exact same function. Um, and then you would go over here and you would find this says master right here. And so this is the master volume for all of the things that are happening here. And then that would go out and then that would go out the board. Um, and you can see here that there's pins, which means that the sound comes out of those. So we're gonna plug our, our cable into that and then plug that into the speakers that we have. Um, so I have here another speaker like this. Uh, now this is a speaker that has an amplifier in it. Sometimes the amplifier is a separate device. Um, and then you would just take again, take the pins and you would plug them into the channel that you want to plug them into here. Um, this, this particular unit is, has something that's really common, which is this, this jack right here, this connection, it's a combo jack. Um, and this is, has the ability to take both a quarter inch cable in the center or an XLR cable, a mic cable on the outsides. Um, this can be really useful if you're uh, only using these and you don't have a mixing board, you just happen to have a, a, a speaker with this. You could realistically plug a microphone into here for a speaker. And uh, if you're doing a program, you have everybody who's using that microphone would use it. And you could also plug a guitar player or uh, another instrument, a keyboard player or something into this other connection. And you wouldn't even need a mixing board in those instances. Uh, and then both of these are similar. They have this control for how much uh, of each of these goes to the main, goes, comes out of the speaker. Um, and this is a pretty common type of device. There's a lot of different speakers that have this amplifier in them and they all look kind of similar. Um, as you can see also, there are the pins here and that means that the sound, the signal you send in can also come out and be sent to another, uh, a different speaker and you would plug it in the same way. And ostensibly, you could just continue to chain them on if you had more than two or four, however many you needed. Um, that's that. That's a pretty sh brief introduction overview to how to use the PA system. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more now about how to do this on the street. Um, so there's lately pretty common uh, it's getting more and more with battery technology, the ability to have uh, devices that don't need to plug into a wall outlet to have power. They have a battery in them. Um, we have a couple examples here to show you. Um, the first is this little guy, which is a pretty steadfast, solid part of the Art of Virginia 
piece. If you've ever been to a circle of protection, you've probably seen this. Uh, this is a Fender Passport Mini. Uh, there are bigger versions of this that are also battery powered. This one's just really handy and carryable. Uh, and it's powered by some rechargeable batteries in the back there. Um, and you can see it has on it, it has those same three holes. So you can plug a microphone in. And then there's another ability to plug in a uh, guitar or a keyboard or something here. Um, another option is this device, this amp. This is my, my guitar amplifier that I use um, when I'm off the grid doing recording and playing music. Um, it's a, by a company called Phil Jones Bass. Um, it's really intended for jazz upright bass players, but that doesn't mean anything. It works all the same. As you can see, there's no way to plug in a microphone that doesn't have those three uh, holes. So you would need that adapter or a converter to plug it into the quarter inch input for the, uh, the guitar if you needed to use a microphone. Uh, this also runs on a battery that is the type of battery they use in RC cars. So it's a lead acid battery, it's about this big um, and runs for about an hour when it's fully charged. Um, and then we've got something here that Nobody else really has. This is Sunbus. This is um, a thing we built for putting on concerts in the Blue Ridge Mountains, off grid and on the street, also supporting rallies and marches and protests uh, without needing to find a power source from a building somewhere. Um, so, this is basically an off grid solar installation mounted in a van. We have here a, a pretty big battery to power the PA system and then an inverter and solar panels to make it all work. Um, and so this is something that if you've been out to Yellowfinch or somewhere in Richmond maybe or Roanoke, you've seen us use this uh, to put on concerts and amplify people's voices for the sake of speaking truth to power. Um, that's a brief overview. There's a bunch of, a bunch of different products like these little amplifiers that have batteries in them that you can use um, if you want to carry them around. They're not super heavy these days uh, and they're really useful. Um, I want to take a moment now also to talk about how to use a microphone. If you ever find yourself in one of these things, in front of one of these things, knowing how to use it and what to do with it. Um, first is a really common thing. I just did this sort of second nature is if you need to take the microphone out and hold it in your hand, you can just pull it towards you, usually with a microphone clip, and then make the cable go free, and then you have a microphone. It's really important also um, that you hold the microphone in a fashion so that it picks up. Microphones that are meant for speaking have this kind of like heart-shaped pattern of where they pick up, so they don't pick up anything from the back, and they're really not great at picking up things from the side, but they're really good at picking up things from the top or the front, depending on how you hold it. Um, a really important way to remember it is this is how you hold an ice cream cone. This is not how you hold a microphone because you're talking right past the microphone when you do that. It's really important to hold it like this and speak into it. Um, it's also important, don't cup it. Don't hold it like this because you're just gonna cause problems um, and it's gonna make your voice sound a little weird. If you need to remember, you can hold it sort of like this like you're squeezing it with your fingertips and that'll keep your hands out of the way and it'll give you the option to the ability to put your arm in a position that's kind of comfortable to hold it up right in front of your uh, mouth. Like Josh said with the megaphone, you don't want to like really get way up on it. Um, and you don't also want to like be way far back from it because then other sounds that are louder than your voice speaking will get picked up by the microphone and people won't be able to hear you. Um, I'm going to take a moment now to demonstrate uh, some of the ways that this works. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
All right, I'm having a little bit of technical technical difficulties. Sorry about that. Um, it's really important that you talk into the microphone. You don't want to do one of these numbers where you're talking to the crowd and you're holding on it like it's a cane and saying things that are really important that you want everybody to hear, but nobody can because you're not using the microphone. Uh, again, hold it right in front of you. If you want to, let the stand do the work of holding it so you don't have to think about where your hands are or anything like that. And you can stand like this and talk. Um, it's also not good to stand back like this. Uh, like I said, it's too far away usually, and it's going to be a real problem to get your voice amplified loud. Um, the, it's also really important that, like Josh said, with feedback, you don't want to point the microphone directly at a speaker or a sound source that's where the microphone is going because you'll cause feedback, which is when the sound just goes in a cycle and gets louder and louder and louder through the system the whole time. Uh, and I think that's all I have. Thanks for listening. Sweet. Thank you, Graham. That was awesome. If you enjoyed the lesson, please give me a thumbs up in the chat just to show us that, you know, that you understood a little bit of what he was saying and you enjoyed it. And now, please welcome another dynamic teacher here with us this evening. Jameson Price of Holy River, who's based in Richmond, Virginia, and has been involved for years in the resistance to the Atlantic Coast and Mountain Valley pipelines, and who will teach us about street drum, street drum making and good practice and dynamic listening. Take it away, Jameson. Hello everyone, my name is Jameson. You've probably seen me playing drums before um, at many actions and many protests. And today I'm gonna to show you uh, how to make drums uh, or uh, modify drums for sound support um, within actions. Um, I call it sound support different than a drum line because sound support to me is uh, we're reinforcing the chants and drum lines are more like you're practicing regularly with other people and have like rhythms already worked out. So this is a much more easy pop up kind of modification of that. And we'll get into that in the live portion. But first, let's talk about the drums and how we find them. So these drums were found on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist. A lot of times you can find drum kits for very little money. Um, uh, because they're in abundance and people are getting rid of them. And so this is a way that we've modified some of the drums. So if you can find a drum kit, you just take all of them apart individually. And then what I'm using to actually strap things on are just pieces of cloth, um, a sheet actually. So if you just cut a strip in a sheet and rip it off, you can rip a whole strip um, off of uh, sheets. And those are also very easy to find or to get at thrift stores or things like that. And so the way that it's been modified is uh, I'm tying it through um, these parts here, through the hardware, and then just goes over your shoulder. And then for drumsticks, we'll get to that in a little bit too, but you can use all kinds of modified things. And this is sort of what... Sometimes uh, people want extra support around their waist, and so you can take this and feed it through all the way through, and then can tie it around your back so that this is more, this is better and stays uh, more straight for you to more easily play. Also, if it's too heavy and folks want relief um, from these types of straps, because sometimes they can be hard on the shoulders, um, you can use this stuff, which is usually used to insulate uh, pipes. You can also use pool noodles. You can just take a piece, cut it off, and attach it to so that you have a little bit of a cushion there on your shoulders, okay? So these are how we've done some drum support. Um, we have one here that I've actually modified. It was a larger kick drum, and so for the street, I wanted to make it lighter, so I actually cut it. I just cut the kick drum in half. Just, zoop, just cut it right in half. And so we're gonna act like we started from scratch with this one. So let's say we bought the drum, 
pretty big. We want to modify it so that it's going to be able to be used on the street. Um, so I would first thing I would do is get it, try to test out its weight, take off the bottom of the head, see if it's still too heavy. If it's still too heavy, just go ahead and cut it. Um, and then you get these sheets that we've had. We start feeding through away for, to wear it. You want to go through a couple of these, maybe up to about three, just to distribute the weight around the drum. And then you get to the top here, you just tie a simple knot. Do the same thing the other side, go through all three of the hardware. And just simple knot up top. And you can just put it on. big and it's wobbly so let's talk about some tools that are pretty critical if you're gonna be somebody who has drums wants to use them to pop up um, want to have a drum key with you uh, only one person really needs to have this and it's gonna be used just to go around and tune the drum a uh, good rule of thumb for tuning drums a good rule of thumb for tuning drums is, is similar to the way that you would tighten a car wheel is uh, you want to try to make star shapes so if I tighten this one then I'm going to go over to this side and do the opposite. If I tighten this one, then I'm going to go over to the other side and do this one. Go to this side, go to this one. So you're not going all the way around like that. You're crisscrossing at each one that you've modified to try to get it to sound better. Um, and so this is how you can use, um, find just random drums. You can make a really large, uh, you know, uh, sound support uh, drum like kind of line thing uh, with just a few kits. Um, and I found that kit for $25 on Facebook Marketplace. This was free. Um, so if you just find some drum kits that are, you know, 50 bucks for the whole kit, if it comes with three toms, a snare, and a kick drum, then that right there is five drums that you just got for like 50 bucks, $10 a drum. Um, and you can usually fundraise for this or you can just personally decide to support it and, and get it. So if you don't have access to a drum and you want to make it out of found objects, uh, buckets are a good alternative. Um, they're not going to sound as nice, obviously, but a uh, bucket is a good alternative to a drum. And I'm going to show you how to turn this bucket into a drum. Uh, and you want to think about any kind of found objects because let's say you're doing an action and you don't have sound support in the way of drums. Well, you can bring pots and pans, you can bring jars, you can bring anything that'll make a sound, um, anything that feels like comfortable. Because I mean, even if I don't want to modify this, uh, this, it's making a good amount of sound already. And you can just carry this around. Um, but if you want it so that you can do double drums, a uh, way to do that really quickly and pretty easily. Just gonna just drill a hole inside of the bucket. Go to the other side. And then take this cloth here, the one that we just used there. We're just going to feed this cloth through the hole. And then you can just tie a knot. And you can put a washer on that if you wanted to. I did bring a washer out for that kind of purpose, but uh, I don't think it's going to really matter. It looks like it's holding pretty well. And then you just go to the other side with the other one. I'll put a washer on this one just so you can see what that process is like in case it pulls out. You just would find a washer. You can find these pretty much anywhere. I find these at job sites or construction sites for free. Um, but you can, they're really inexpensive. So you just put a washer on. 
tie a double knot again, slide it up to the washer, and then that'll hold a lot better on the inside of the drum. So you just tie it up however high you want it. So let's say, okay, that's about my height there. Put a knot there. Now I got a drum that I can use both hands. It's even got a little bit of a rattle. So uh, that's kind of how we work on drums, how we're going to modify and uh, make drums out of any kind of random everyday object. Um, and now let's talk about sticks. Okay, so once you've decided what you want your drums to be, whether that be a drum kit that you've modified into street drums or just buckets or pots and pans, you're going to want to uh, find some sticks that are appropriate to use, especially if you're going to use the drums. Like if you're going to find, if you're going to upcycle these drums from a kit, you want to use something that's going to be rounded on the end so you don't puncture a lot of holes in your drum. Um, so that doesn't mean it has to be a drumstick. Like this is a drumstick, right? And Oftentimes you can find drumsticks for free if you go to music venues um, or concert halls or places where music have happened. A lot of times they just have an abundance of sticks that have been somewhat destroyed or peeled off from drummers that are there getting rid of their sticks and you can usually ask about those things. But let's say you don't have access to that. Um, this was a leg of a, of a chair. This was the end of a broom. Um, this was just some trim that was sanded on the end. And so I'm going to kind of show you how to make just an, any everyday kind of object, turn them into a drum stick. So here we have a piece of bamboo and we have the end piece of trim. Now, the reason why we wouldn't want to use these the way they are, especially on a drum, is you could puncture a hole in the drum head. And so we're going to sand these down. And that's what I do with almost all of the drums that I have. Um, you can sand manually. I just use an electric one because it's just a lot easier to do fast. Okay, so you you've sanded these down. You can see now they're a lot more a lot more uh, smooth on the end, so they're not going to puncture holes. Uh, speaking of which, if you do go the, w the way and the route of drums, which I recommend because drums are just louder and they're more powerful, and if you happen to have somebody that's willing to support buying drums and converting them, I think it's a, a better way to go. Um, carrying around some clear tape, some stronger clear tape uh, with you, if you're the person that's bringing the drums and is sort of like manifesting this project, is a really good idea to bring with in case you have to do quick patches and you can use any tape but you can see there was a hole that came here put some painters tape on it if a hole pops up here you just put some clear tape on it or painters tape um, drum heads are pretty durable but you want to just make sure you hit them with flatter like flat round objects instead of sharp and pointy objects obviously and then when you're done with this just so that when people are using them they know which end is used as the handle and which end is used as the one that actually makes contact with the drum i usually just tape off you know like kind of do a mock handle with some painter's tape or any kind of tape and this just sort of universally communicates with people here's where i put my hand so you do that to all your sticks once you've picked the side that you want to sand you tape off the side where you want people to grip them so that people just kind of have an idea of how to do that and where to put their hands. So I wanted to mention uh, quickly uh, before we moved on, uh, we were talking about sticks. And if you're the person that has manifested or is the person that has brought the, um, the collection of drums, the sound support ensemble to your action, then it's really uh, smart to have a backpack. Um, or something that you can carry so that you can still play the drums, you can still have sticks here. And then that way, if somebody needs to, to dip out before the action is over, it's way easy for them to just come and put the sticks right into your backpack. You're not having to stop what you're doing and move things and recollect them. So having a backpack um, available and able to store everything is a pretty crucial, uh, pretty crucial tool to have. So just to go over again, the crucial tools, if you're the person that is bringing the sound support and the drums, having tape, having a drum key, having a drum key, 
and having a backpack with the sticks for people to drop off. Yeah, so another really important part of this drum is that when you get a drum and it's a baby like this, you can see I've already put some stickers on here, but a really important part of this is, is adding stickers, putting some flair to your, uh, to your thing. So we can see we have Funa bombs here, definitely good. Abolish Columbus Day, obviously. Abolish Columbus Day. 100% clean energy, America needs it now. There's all the saints, shout out to Lily, all the saints. Stop work now, MVP. So this is something that like, you're going to actions and you have these drums. It's a good way to, to participate is to get people's stickers and messages and, uh, and add them to the drum. And it's uh, good to show like all kinds of different movements. We're all intertwined with our movements. So even though a lot of the things we're talking about is environmental justice, uh, it also has a lot to do with all of our other shared causes like abolishing Columbus Day, which should be abolished. And all Columbus statues should be removed wherever they are. Okay, so now that you put your stickers on your drums and uh, you've gotten it to a place where you modified it and you're comfortable, whether that be, you know, two armholes here, one going around the waist, whatever feels comfortable for you, you might have to help adjust with other people. Once we have the items, whether they're found items or intentional drum items to make the noise, then we get to the place where we learn how to make that noise together. So uh, live, we will be talking about intuitive listening and how this isn't really a drum line and it's more sound support for the movement. So uh, the next segment, which will be on live on our Zoom call will be uh, the segment of sound support. Hi, uh, so I hope you enjoyed that video. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the last part of that was giving an example of what intuitive listening uh, within an action looks like. A lot of times when I'm coming to actions, instead of trying to bring just like a, an orchestrated, already prepared rhythm, I'm listening to the, um, the chants and the mantras that they've already brought. And so intuitive listening means just showing up with drums, finding people who have passions about drums, even people who um, can count to four or have an idea of what the rhythms and the chants are. It's reinforcing that idea of like you're showing up to somebody else's actions and you want to uplift the, uh, the things that they brought to the action. You want to uplift the message that they have that they want to convey. And so you're listening to the chants and you're finding the rhythm of the chants and then you're just reinforcing that. And what often ends up happening is the chance can exist in a larger space amongst uh, a larger area of the action because you're establishing a rhythm for everyone to sort of hold on to. And there's like a pocket that everybody has. Um, so uh, yeah, that's pretty much intuitive listening. And so if you're the person that decides you wanna manifest these drums and you have questions about that more afterwards, I'd, I'd love to talk to you more, um, but you're just showing up and you're talking to people. Hey, do you have an interest in playing? You wanna join? What are the chants? Let's, in, let's uh, support the communities that are already here and support the messages that they brought.
And the last thing that we're going to do together, everyone, we've been doing these breakout sessions and um, this breakout session is going to be fun and the, hopefully the funnest breakout session we've done. It's very brief. And so uh, don't worry. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go and we're, you're going to get on your screen an invitation to go to the breakout room. You're going to go to the breakout room and with your people in the group breakout room, you're going to go and you'll have two minutes to find something that you can use as a drum or a noisemaker, you're gonna have, you get extra points if it's not a traditional instrument. Mm -hmm. And you're going to play it for your people in your break breakout room and do a little show and tell. And then we're gonna invite you back and, and we're going to all, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, okay, one, two, three, and we'll unmute everyone and we'll all play our noisemakers together. And that will be the end of our sensing workshop officially unless you want to stick around and ask any questions to the people who get creative y'all and our teachers who are with us right now so um you're going to get an invitation to a breakout room and then go find your instruments see you soon All right, everyone. Let's see. Oh, wait. Where is everybody else? There we go. Do you all have your instruments prepared? You're sideways. I'm sideways again. Does everyone have their instruments? Will you hold up your instruments? And you can scroll. Now people might want to go to hold up your instruments. Now people might want to go to gallery view if you see your cue so they can see everybody. Good call, Kay. You might want to see everybody's instruments. So hold up your instruments and play. Yay! Yay!
Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for playing along. Thanks. Yeah. That was awesome, you guys. That was just amazing. Um, big thank you to Josh, Graham, and Jameson for the wonderful lessons this evening. Please join us for our Sun Singing in Place concert next Thursday at 7 p.m. live on Artivism Virginia Facebook, Vimeo, and YouTube, where our focus will be on the VNG Header and Justice Project and the protection of Charles City County. Feel free to share with and invite your friends and come on back for our next street scene workshop here on Zoom on May 28th. Stay safe, be well, and we thank you. Until we meet again next time, good night. And uh, like we said, feel free to stay in case you have some questions for the teachers. All right, y'all. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Never for, never forget the uh, that found objects and <laughs> you know some some consistent noises from a ragtag group of underdogs can can actually make a difference. Oh yeah, and don't doubt your abilities. Don't doubt your abilities to play. Uh, I hear people all the time like, oh, I don't have a musical bone in my body. And I always say, what are you talking about? You've been playing drums since the day you were born. That heartbeat. <laughs> exactly. The most important part of a drum circle is the heartbeat. Wait, unless you're at a concert and you have a tambourine and you don't know really how to play music, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pick, find a quiet instrument for that learning period. <laughs> Maybe don't go straight to cowbell or tambourine. Yeah, just, just start with a carrot peeler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> carrot peeler. That's a great <laughs> instrument. Very quiet. Very subtle. So do we have any questions for the teachers that we had tonight? Just unmute yourself and go at it. I guess I have a ton of questions for Graham about like how you got a solar powered music setup going. Um, Cause I know, I think I saw you guys last year um, at the protest against the um, Union Hill and MVP. And I know, I think Josh, were you running a tube amp off of that? Yeah, we were, we were running all sorts of stuff off of, uh, off of the sun bus. Um, Graham, what's the what's the quick rundown of the capability? So, uh, so Micah, it's a it's a ten kilowatt battery pack. There's a lot of juice in it, um, and the reality is is that audio equipment doesn't really use too much power. They have um, they have ratings on the equipment. You know, it's a fifty watt amp or a in in Sunbus's case, there's a 5,000 watt PA system inside it, um, and those are those are ratings for the most. It's like a peak max power that the the unit will draw. Um, but the reality is, is they're never doing that. Uh, there's a lot of times with if you're looking at spec sheets for stuff with audio gear, you'll see there's usually um, on the more higher end stuff, a, a rating for, there's a peak rating and then an RMS rating, which is like an average rating. And then there's a one eighth power rating. And that's really how much power you're gonna be drawing with that piece of equipment. And that's because um, the nature of music and audio in general is it's not always on all the way to the max and then you know as a sine wave it's not like that uh so it'll go up to the max for like 10 milliseconds or like one tenth of a second and then it'll go right back down to like less than that and so you're never it's not like a motor that is all the way on all the time for a duration of period it's like if you were to um, 
uh, like gun the motor real quick and then stop and then gun the motor real quick and then stop, you wouldn't be using that much power. Um, to, to, to illustrate and get, share an example, I put on a jazz festival uh, on Capitol Hill. I live in Washington, DC. And so I put a jazz festival on, on Capitol Hill this past fall and with a full band on stage with keyboards and amps and uh, the lights going because it was getting dark and the full PA system going with all the monitors for everybody and everything, uh, that whole operation was using like 400 watts of power. So it's, it, it's not that hard. Uh, a lot of the new, there's new little portable PA systems that are, have a lithium battery in them. Um, and they'll run for like eight hours on that battery because you're just not using that much power when you're doing it. You have the capability to, but to be real, turning, it, it hurts and it is physically dangerous to turn Sunbus up all the way. It's just not, it's way too much to, to like do that. But we built it to fill, fill a valley with sound and it does that very well. Any other questions? Um, I, just, I just wanted to say I was quickly unmuting myself and Micah too. I think you were muted there for a second, Micah, when you spoke. Still muted. Oh, I said, I said that's, that's awesome information. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. I do, I do want to add real quick because I definitely have been in a, a pinch and run a lot of mics through guitar amps that having the converter that has the impedance correction in there too really helps. There's a lot more details to like how you do that and what, what goes on because there's, there's also like what you're plugging into is expecting a certain voltage as well. Even if the impedance is matching, if you're not sending the right voltage to it, it can get weird sometimes. Um, but that's it's really high level technical stuff. And unless you are building the equipment or buying like the components to do it, you're probably never going to interact with that. Those little transformers can be awful. Awful handy though, if you got one or two around. You never oh, yeah. know. I've got a whole box of stuff for the you never know type scenarios. I think also the about batteries. guitar amps is they're not designed for the human voice. Like the whole circuitry and the speakers and everything are really designed to, to re reproduce a guitar. Uh, and so they can get kind of weird with intelligibility at times because the, they're designed to distort. It's like a desirable quality in them for the guitar. So if, as you start talking louder, it just gets distorted because the amp is designed to do that. So it can be a, a challenge sometimes. Hey, Jameson, I got a question for you. When it comes to street drumming, is there uh, kind of like a universal signal of like starting and stopping? Is that like I one like rhythm or is it like multiple or? I found it to be really intuitive. Um, like, so a lot of folks that go to actions, right, they know that it's like there's these waves of energy that happen. So it'll be like everybody's kind of engaging and then everyone sort of gets a little tired and so sort of things like peter out and then it goes back up. And so uh, unless people are like talking and a speaker's trying to speak, that's like the only time you really have to just get everyone to like, hey, stop. And that I feel like is already happening around you because people are already doing that to the human voice, right? You know, so when somebody's like trying to, hey, I'm trying to talk here, everyone's already going like, shh. So the drums are, it's like, I love the idea of hand signals and I love like playing in organized uh, drum lines, which I've done before. But it's like, I notice when I give people who aren't used to playing drums in a public way like that too many things it's just like overload circuits so just like play this drum focus on the chance do the best you can and you'll know when we're supposed to stop and know when we're supposed to play kind of thing. maybe okay. it's too casual, but that's what i do <laughs> now that that makes sense because I, I figure like when you know you go into the street you're going to be dealing with a lot of people that you know some people may have never played a, a percussive instrument at all in their life so to give them a rhythm or something to try to remember that could be like just very bad 
Yeah, so that's happened before, right? For sure. And I'll try to go right over next to that individual and just hit on whatever we're talking about. So if we're doing like water is life, water is life, I'm just going to stand next to that person to try to get their hands to match their mouths, right? Water <laughs> is life. Water <laughs> is life. This is all you, this is, you got this. Water is life. You hold that. Water is life. You got it. Water is life. And then I have to yeah, you know, and it, it can build from there. <laughs> Sweet. Well, thank you, James. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> Listen, is it a good idea in a larger march or action rally to have the drums together in one place or to scatter them through the crowd? I think, that, I think it's scattered. I think it depends on how well they've communicated with the organizers and how well the the movement knows the the mantras of their movement, if that makes sense, right? So if like if it's a strong crew that's been well organized, I think you can spread that out. And if people know chance and they are have established chance for a long period of time, they have that relationship um, with their voices, then I think it's like, yeah, that can that can be spread out. But if it's gonna be like corn kind of like we're just calling as many people as we can together and it's a lot of different um, groups coming together and having sort of like a combined movement. I think sometimes it's like, yeah, just find your spot where you know you can affect the, the loudest, most powerful moment. You just hold that moment. I think ideally you would want two strong drummers in each section of the line to be able to hold down the beat. That's what's most important because then it's just chaos if you don't have strong drummers that are holding it together and being willing to talk about i think intuitive listening in a way that doesn't feel like it's demeaning the way somebody's playing just like hey we're listening you know like you're 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 not even saying like you're doing a bad job in my point of view it's like we're supporting the words that somebody else is having so what i'm having that respect you're having that respect we're all like listening to what's happening and trying to like how is that going to sound the best that it can sound you know i think also to speak from my experience for that a little bit, Kay, it, if you have if you have people spread out, but they're actually still kind of close to each other, it can get kind of chaotic with the rhythms because like they're, you know, they might only be 200 feet away. So you can still hear them and then it gets, it gets weird with the, the interactions between which rhythm the people near you are chanting to um, and also who you're playing with because if they're that sort of that close you you could ostensibly be hearing that other group that uh you could play to them and something that's really easy to forget is that sound takes time to travel so it's about a thousand feet a second so if you're 500 feet away it's a half a second delay and so then it goes back as well. So it takes a half a second for the chant to get to you. And then it takes a half a second for your drum sound to get back to the chant. And so it gets, it gets to be really weird and chaotic if you're not like really close to the people you're supporting with the drum. Um, and just like to remind people that uh, some of these workshops are recorded and the first one on song and chant uh, we made an attempt to sort of link a drum pattern with some new chant, uh, many new ones for the potential Green New Deal Virginia. So that's on the Art of Ism page if you if you want to go back and, and take a peek at that. I have a question for the megaphone teacher. Um, so have you been in situations where the m people with megaphones were stationed along a march or a crowd and they were sort of relaying uh, information about the next chant or the next mm, safety or just as a communication system, does it make sense to have kind of staged megaphones over the length of a longer march? Or does anybody, not necessarily just Josh, does anybody have experience with that? Well, there are a number of different benefits to doing so, doing something like that. I'm trying to just roll through my memory and, and pick out 
a good example, though I think I probably have more examples to reference of like maybe being like the guy who brought the megaphone, you know, or or maybe someone else brought the megaphone, but they're not, you know, their main thing is not maybe leading the chant or the call. So there was a handoff. Um, yeah, that, that type of coordination, if multiple folks have that tool, I, it is multifaceted uh, in benefits in that, you know, you can reduce the amount of burden that a single person has to carry for like keeping the energy going that can be really exhausting if like you were the person with the megaphone and also simultaneously the only person who was like stepped up to to lead chance or transition the group from one place to another and kind of worry about the direction of the flow of the folks um and yeah, having having a little a little tag team energy is nice because it ma it makes people feel like if they're in a traveling group or a, a big group that they're kind of like in good hands. Like there's uh, you know there's multiple people who are who are keeping track of what's going on. Um, I think the events that I can remember in which that dynamic was going on where folks were really coordinated were like some larger events in DC, like the, the women's March. And, but of course then you have so many different groups and, and so many different sounds going on. It, you know, the, the line between coordination and confusion can, can often be a little hard to walk if, if you have a lot of, a lot of folks. Well said, Josh. Hi guys. Hey, Maura. I had like three different places, virtual places to be at once tonight. So it's really good to see all your faces. I just wanted to point out something from a march we had here in Richmond. Where, um, someone, I think it was Katie, was carrying the med phone up and down the, the march and like listening to the people that were starting songs or chants. And, and for me, that was essential because I had like a flag in one arm a banner in the other and you know a sign tucked under the other arm oh wait i only have two um, so it was like impossible for me to hold it but it like the energy needed to shift and she was really in tune with who was you know putting that out there and helping to elevate that so that's a really wonderful role to play in that sort of scenario well, guys, it looks like our time is up. I just want to thank you guys for staying on, getting your questions out. I just want to give a special shout out to all the teachers. Like I said, great job, guys. And um, once again, I can't wait to see you guys on the next street scene. We love you. Thank you for spending time with us tonight. Bye, y'all. Thanks, y'all.